Mashlom Ka. Told no. Scott. Told I said Mashlom Ka, not Mashlom Kim. So the difference is, I am using the masculine singular, and you all need to wait to see to whom I'm addressing. Mashlom Ka, Scott. Told me Mashlom Ka, Dennis. Told me Mashlom Ka, George. Told Mashlom Ka, David. Told all right, we've got a few toes and a few toed melons, but I didn't get any raws or raw melons, so that's a great deal. Okay? This is where we were last time, Psalm 103, verses 11 and 12, I believe. And uh, we talked about how you had these comparison clauses here. Uh, as high as the heavens above the earth, uh, his steadfast love prevails over those who fear him. As distant as east is from west, he has made distant from himself our transgressions. And so as we look at verses 13 and 14 as we go on, we have a continuation of these comparative clauses. We have the kaf preposition, kerahim of albanim. Everyone pronounce it after me. Kerahim of albanim. And here it's as the as a father is merciful to children. The idea here would be understood as his children. Rechem Yahweh al Yireau. That's Rechem Yahweh al Yireau. Everyone? Rechem Yahweh al Yireau. Yahweh is merciful to those who fear him. So the comparison carried on. And here we have Rahim is the PL infinitive construct. And so it's as Yahweh is merciful, as merciful as Yahweh, or as, as a father, excuse me, as, as a father is merciful, or as merciful a father to understood his children. Even though it's literally Banim, remember Banim is used for children as well. There's no different word in Hebrew. Uh, you have to look by the, at context, and obviously in this context we're not limiting it to sons alone. And then Rechem is a PL perfect. Uh, Yahweh is compassionate or is merciful to those who fear Him. Uh, Yireau is a uh, cow. <coughs> Participle, active participle, masculine plural in the construct state with a third masculine singular pronominal suffix. Ki hu yaga yitzreinu. Ki hu yada yitzreinu. Everyone? Ki hu yada yitzreinu. And here we'll have to go by the context and find out how the key is to be translated. Sometimes it is causal, therefore it be translated as because or for. Sometimes it is emphatic, and therefore be translated as indeed or truly. Uh, so we'll look at this and see how it works out as we go through the rest of the verse. For, I'll start with, because that's the most often usage of, the most frequent usage of it. Uh, for, he, notice the third masculine singular pronoun uh, of the pronoun, third masculine singular pro pronoun, who, that is emphatic because yada is a cal perfect third masculine singular. And so the subject is already in it because the third masculine singular verb, you have a third masculine singular subject. Yada by itself is he knew, or he knows, or he will know. So he himself, emphatic personal pronoun, for he himself knows yitzreinu. And then we have to look at that and say, okay, now what is Yitzreinu? And here we end up with a noun that has to do with thought, has to do with planning, Yetzer. And here it's being used with a first common plural pronominal suffix. He knows our thoughts. He knows our plans. Zakur ki afar ennachnu. All right, one more time I'll read it. Zakur ki afar ennachnu. Everyone? Zakur ki afar ennachnu. Zakur is a cow. 
passive participle masculine singular from zakar. Uh, remember is the root meaning zakar. So zakor would to be remembered or is remembered or will be remembered. Ki afar. In other words, it is remembered that afar dust enach enachnu we are. In other words, it is remembered that we are dust. So, because he knows our thought, our plans, and because of the context with afar, there is another option uh, for yetzer, and that is the idea of the form of one, taken from the verb yatzer, he formed. Yetzer can have the idea of form or frame. So that uh, because he knows our frame, he knows our makeup, he knows the way we are formed, it is remembered, in other words, he remembers. The passive here is a divine passive. His idea is he's the one who is the agent of the remembering. And so it is remembered, or he remembers, that we are dust. So as we look at this, these two verses go well together. We have the comparative shown again of his mercy, and he's merciful because he knows our frame. He knows our makeup. He knows that we're mere men. He knows that we are fallen beings. He knows that we have a sin nature that uh, is something that has to be dealt with, and he remembers that we are merely human mortals, we're made of dust. We were made out of the dust. Dust we are, and to dust we shall return, as he said to Adam in uh, the response to Adam after the fall in uh, Genesis uh, chapter 3. As we look at the poetics of this, the continuation of the calf preposition that we had in verses uh, 11 and 12, the same type of advancement, the progressive parallelism, where the second line continues the thought of the first line, and it has the repetition of uh, Rahem, and we have Yahweh as the subject specified, and uh, we have Rahem repeated, so the repetition helps to give the emphasis on mercy or compassion. And then in the next line, we have a uh, synonymous parallelism, and we have an order in the first line that is different than the order in the second line. The key clauses are two different kinds. The first one is a causal, the second one is an object clause. And uh, the two verbs, yada and zakar, are synonyms of knowledge, of remembrance. Remembering, remember, is not the idea that uh, Yahweh forgets. Remember is not to suddenly bring out what one has forgotten. In this case, is the idea that he is mindful of. He's aware of, the same as Yada. He is aware of our frame. He is aware that we are merely dust. And that framework, that makeup, is because we are mortals. We are dust. And so we have the same type of uh, phraseology being utilized. Uh, the we and our frame, uh, we could argue that Anachnu here in pause, so therefore the path act is heightened to a comments next to the salute. Uh, it could be parallel to the pronominal suffix nu on the word above it, and that yetzer could be parallel to afar, so you could diagram that and color code it differently if you desired. I looked at it merely in the structural, but if we were to look at it lexically uh, and grammatically, we would want to maybe change that color coding and change the relationships. Okay, any questions? How would you change the color coding in that instance? What, how would you indicate it? Uh, for example, uh, I would, uh, key who would remain the same, the tan or gold. The key in the second line would remain gold, but affair would be white like yitzer and the new I would change to a different color, maybe green, on the end of the first line, and match that with an acne. So the new and an acne would be one color, the yitzre, yitzre and afar would be another color. 
Would they still be a C and C1 parallel? No, I would change it then. That would become an A, B, C, D. And then you would have a B, A, C, D. Because the we would parallel each other as the D element. The new suffix on the word at the end of the first line and the next. And then afar and yitzer would parallel each other as co-equivalent nouns, frame and dust. And then you mentioned that the key clause can either be uh, emphatic or causal. Right. And, then and here like I would take it, I would take it as causal in its relationship to Zakur. Even though there's an emphatic nature to he himself, that wouldn't delineate it no. as emphatic. No. If you have an emphatic personal pronoun, it does not make the key emphatic. The key is emphatic by context and context alone. Here I take it as a simple causal. Because he is mindful of our frame, the idea is, therefore, it is remembered that we are dust. If it were emphatic, how would you translate it? Indeed. Indeed is the way to translate the emphatic key. All right? All right, anyone else? Any other questions? I apologize for the way the uh, screen color shows up there on the red. Uh, when sometimes the... Uh, what I see here looks much brighter than what you see up there. <laughs> so I would probably change those colors and make them a little bit brighter. All right. We'll continue on with Psalm 103. Remember, uh, as we go through this in the days ahead, that on April 24th, we will be doing oral translation of the first 10 verses of Psalm 103. And on April 26th, you have a written translation due of Psalm 103, 11 through 22. If you do a little bit of math, you'll find out we will not be through with our devotion of Psalm 103 by the time you need to complete it. So be certain you do complete it before uh, we get to the end of it in our devotional time. We'll finish it up a uh, devotional time throughout the rest of the semester. All right, I'll turn that off there and a little bit. And we're going to go back to do some more translation in uh, Genesis chapter 37. And I believe, if I am correct, that uh, we had gotten down through verse 7 in translation. And we're preparing to do verse 8. Uh, Michael, did I call on you? Did you get to translate last time? No. You did not. Okay, I had your name down here, and I didn't know if I just failed to put a grade in. But, so, Michael, I'll ask you, if you would, please, to uh, read through uh, Athnach on verse 8 in Hebrew, and then translate. Weyomiru. 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 Lo, ehau. Hamalok, Timalok, Alenu, Im, Mashol, Tim, Shol, Banu. All right, and translate. Then his brother said to him, Will, will you, will you, will you surely reign over us, or? Will you rule over us? All right. Now let's take a good look at this. There's a number of things to talk about. It's got some uh, constructions that are not that familiar to you. Uh, Wayomru is correctly translated as so uh, they said to him. Uh, we look at this in the context. It seems to be a result of his telling the dream. So we'll use the so. You could also use then, showing chronological sequence. Uh, said to his brothers. The how. Uh, the hey with a hotipathic under it is the interrogative hey. The interrogative hey indicates we have a question. So as you put what they ask in double quotes, remember to put a punctuation at the end of the sentence that is a question mark to indicate that you've noted this is a, uh, a question, and then word it properly in English so it comes out. Malok is a cal infinitive absolute. Cal infinitive absolute from Malak. Timblok is the Cal imperfect second masculine singular by context. We know the same form as third feminine singular, but they're not speaking to their sister. 
uh, in third person, they're speaking to Joseph, their brother, in the second person, speaking to him directly. And so it's you. And so it's, uh, will you indeed reign alenu over us? Why indeed, or surely, or actually, or really? Will you really reign over us? Will you really be king over us? Will you really rule over us? Any of those are possible. Uh, it's because we have the pre-positive, intensive, cognate, infinitive, absolute. All right, let's go over that again. Pre-positive, intensive, cognate, infinitive, absolute. One of the CIA twins, remember? We had PI and PC as the CIA twins. The CIA stands for cognate, infinitive, absolute. Cognate means from the same root. From the same root. Malok is from the same root as Timlok. They're both from Malak. If the infinitive absolute, if the cognate infinitive absolute is in front of the finite form of the verb, then it is pre-positive. Pre, before, positive, position. If it is after, it is post-positive. Post, after, positive, position. Positioned after. Here, it's positioned in front of. Malok, Timlok. Therefore, it's pre-positive. Since it's pre-positive, it is intensive in meaning. If it is post-positive, it is continuative in meaning. Keep on doing something. But pre-positive, it's intensive. So we translate as indeed, actually, surely, really, to show that intensification. Will you really reign over us? Now the next word is the problem word. In, in some situations, can be taken as Michael translated as or. But normally, im is a conditional particle meaning if. And in this context, it is best to translate it as if because they are expressing their doubt. They're expressing their doubt by the question, will you really reign over us if indeed you will rule mashal? You have to have two different translations, malak and mashal. So if you translate malak as rule, then you're in trouble with mashal. So it's best to use reign or be king for malak and use rule for mashal. If indeed, emphatic, P-I-C-I-A twin. All right. If indeed you will rule, bandu, bait preposition with a first common plural pronominal suffix over us, or you shall rule us. If indeed you shall rule us, you don't have to have a preposition translated there. The bait introduces the direct object of my shall. Okay, any questions on the first half of verse 8? Chat. Um, where do you get the if from for M. if and D? M, M means if? If. Correct. Does it, mean, mm -hmm. I thought, does it normally mean with? No. The if you're talking about is spelled this way. Oh. I am not an olive. Okay, it sounds the same. It's a homo, ho, homonym in... Uh, sound, but it's not the same. It's different. Yes? Can that be translated as or? It, as Michael translated as or, you can. I prefer <coughs> not to in this case. Because I think it, the emphasis here is on their doubt. If indeed you shall. The idea is, and you will not, in our minds. Okay? But or is a legitimate translation of in, in some situations. And some have chosen it here. Okay? Anyone else? Yes, Scott? Just Kind of you go over that translation of that last part of that sentence. It seems pretty awkward. Okay, let me go over the, the whole uh, line here. So, his brother said to him, Will you really reign over us if indeed you shall rule us? 
seems like it hangs there at the end. It almost appears like there's a question that ends with the be king over us, but then you don't have a full sentence at the end. How do you no, it is a full that? sentence because it's all one sentence. So there is no, the question mark would not go after. It goes at the very end of that. So, his brothers said to him, double quote, Will you really reign over us, comma, if indeed you shall rule us, question mark? End of double quote. Because we find out when we go to the next line, we have a wadi toll, so we return to the narrative framework. Jan? So question mark uh, applies to both of them? Yes, it is. The whole sentence. It's, it's one sentence, it's a conditional sentence. It, it, it said in reverse in the Hebrew, the then clause, the apotesis is first. If I were to turn it around and say it some other way, you'd understand it as one sentence without a problem. If, if, I, if we would read this, uh, his, so his brother said to him, If you really think that you'll rule us, do you? Or will you will you really reign over us? Uh, the idea is is if you uh, how can I put it? They are saying, in effect, you will not reign over us because there's no possible way that you'll rule over us. The if is a doubting statement. If and they're saying if and it's impossible that you would ever rule over us. Will you really reign over us? It's a doubled statement, yes. It sounds awkward a little bit in English. It's uh, perhaps awkward even in the Hebrew. Remember, they're emotional. They're angry. They're upset. We can't expect them to have perfect grammar or not to have uh, some uh, awkwardness to the way they're saying it. The, the idea is their focus, their emphasis. Yes? There's a... Uh... There's a question in my mind that if he will reign at all, not that he will exercise the right. reign over them. Yes, if, if, if indeed you, no, it, it's the last saying, is over us also, bond. It's not that they're saying, well, there's a question if you will reign, but will you really exercise reign over us? No, as your brothers? no the us is over is at the end of both of them. No, it's Alenu on one and Bandu on the other. They're not saying, if you will reign over anybody, will you reign over us? No. Both of them end in us. Both end in us. Alainu and Bonnie. Okay? All right? Yes, Chad. Would it be proper, or could you translate the uh, preposition of Banu to say something like, if indeed um, you rule among us? Not among. Among gives the idea that maybe they will be rulers too. Bait here is given in the lexicon as the introduction, the introducing particle for the direct object of Masha. Under the entry for Masha. If you look oh, at Masha, Masha. Okay. you'll find it listed in the lexicon as Masha followed by bait. Preposition indicates direct object, the accusative of Masha. Okay? All right. Any other questions? They are emphatically saying they do not think it is at all possible that he will rule over them. That's what they're saying. Uh, was there another question before we go to James? James, you had a question. Yeah. Um, okay. Just when you translate it, when you put in that they're over us, does that have to be in italics? Uh, no, not at all, because it's it's there. Alainu. I mean, if the uh, at the end, Banu? that's Banu. Okay. So if we put in over, we wouldn't have to put that in italics. Oh no, absolutely not. It's in the text. It's in the text. You're translating the base preposition as over. Okay. And you're translating the new first common plural suffix as us. Because that's what it is. It's a preposition plus first common plural phenomenal suffix. So you'd never put in italics what's in the text. Okay? Anyone else? But remember the option there is not to translate as a rule over us, but to just say rule us and leave over out. In other words, you're omitting the translation of the base. Because according to the lexicon, it introduces the accusative of the verb masha. Okay? Everyone else clear on that? All right, James, if you would read the second line then for us. James Wood. Okay. While 
Y of C2. C2. O. Seno. Toto. L. Hollow. Motel. Wow. Never well. All right. And translated, that would be what? <coughs> Then they increase uh, again or still hating him. Uh, Here, I will be translated because of. Because of? Because of, so because of his dreams and his... Because, and because of, of his words. Right. Okay, remember, al has many, many different meanings. Don't get stuck on upon or above. Right? I mean, upon, above, against, it very often means against. It can mean beside, and it can also mean because of. So make certain you look at al carefully in Holiday's lexicon and see all the variety of means it can have. John? Can you put four? <coughs> four? Yes. You use four as well. Four in the sense of because of. Yes. Okay. Anyone else? All right. So they hated him all the more, is another way to translate it. Increased more, increased again, the idea of all the more. They hated him all the more because of, or as Jan said, for his dreams and for his words, because of his words. Okay, any other questions on this one? Yes, Chad. How is it that um, Al has also the meaning because of, because all the other meanings are like uh, in regards to location, and because of is more logical? You'll have to go ask some ancient Hebrew why they did it, and they probably couldn't answer that question either. The language just came to be used that way. It's uh, the same as we have certain words in English that... Uh, uh, can have many different meanings depending on the context they're in, even though it's the same word. That's why our dictionaries sometimes have eight or nine or ten meanings for a word. And sometimes in different categories, science, as opposed to math, as opposed to music, as opposed to conversation, etc. It just happens to be one of the usages of that. Okay. Anyone else? Yes, James? When we have because of repeated in English, do we have to repeat that again in our translation? You do not have to repeat it again in your translation if it's very clear by your translation and the context that obviously goes together with the first because of. And here there'd be no problem saying because of his dreams and his words. That's, it's so close together and the way your translation is with them both at the end, I don't think there's any way of misunderstanding. So it'd be perfectly legitimate. What you have to watch out for is those situations where it might be ambiguous if you leave it out. Here, I don't think there's that ambiguity. So you can smooth it out by only saying it once. Okay? All right. Any other questions? All right. Let's go to verse 9 then. And uh, Scott Basol, let's take you. The whole verse. Uh, no, take it to, uh, let's see, where's the AFNAC here? Uh, go to the afternoon. Why yet alone? Old alone? A hair? Why yet? Uh, why yes a pair? Why yes a pair? Notice the doggish in the page. Why yes a pair? Oto? Le e ha 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 Yeah, let it out. 
that code, wow, just gets me every time. <laughs> okay. Yeah, but you're not pronouncing the, uh, either one of them. It's a silent W at the end. Ow. Let a how. Okay, then he dreamed again. Dream. Uh, another, then he dreamed again. Another dream. How would you say that better in English since we don't say dream to dream? Then he dreamed another, then he dreamed again. Why not just say he, he had, had another, another dream. dream? Then he had another dream. He had another dream, right. Make you think here too, sorry, sorry. Well, that's, that's what we got to do in this class. we got to make you think. Okay, exactly. Uh, then he dreamed, then he had another dream. So he reported, so he reported it to his brothers. All right, good. Wayak Halom, Cal imperfect, third masculine singular from Chalam, a Wayak tall verb. Ode again. Halom is the word for dream, the noun. Acher is the adjective meaning another. Agrees with Halom in gender and number. It is masculine singular. Wayasaper, apia, imperfect. Third masculine singular from Safer. Why you toll again? Oto, the direct object marker, plus third masculine singular formal <coughs> suffix. Le achau, a lamed preposition attached to the noun ach, brother, in the masculine plural construct. We know it's plural construct because the yod. And the wow tells us it's a third masculine singular pronominal suffix attached to it. So it's to his brothers. All right? Any other questions on that part, that half of the verse? Scott? The oat, where normally it might be him. Oto. Oto. Uh, excuse me, yeah, oto. It can be him, it can be it. Can the feminine also be her or it? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay, remember here, hello is a masculine singular noun. Dream. Right. So how would you refer to it? You have to use a third masculine singular pronominal suffix. It has to agree with Sanasi. Okay. Anyone else? All right. Let's go further. Roger, would you take the last half of verse 9, please, starting there after the Athmac? Halem old Lehine Hashemesh 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 Wehe Yahre Wehe Yareya Wehe Yareya Wehe 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 Asha Koka Birin Koka Vin Koka Vin Mishtehawin 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 Lit All right. In translation. And said, Behold. I dreamt a dream again. Behold, the sun and the moon and eleven stars bow down to me. All right, good. All right, let's walk through this. Wayomir. That's again that word that you should be abundantly familiar with. Uh, then he said, Kine. Now remember in section 3.3.3 in the Hebrew Bible insert, Kine in dream reports is not to be translated. So just ignore it. It's just introducing the different panels of the dream, the different scenes or visions of within the dream. And so just, just ignore it. It does not need to be translated. Then he said, I had a, a dream again. Or you could say, 
I had again a dream, or again I had a dream, and the sun and the moon and eleven stars were bowing down to me, or were doing obeisance to me. As we walk through this, Wayomer, Cal, imperfect, third masculine, singular, Wayitol, come Amer, Kalanti, Cal, perfect, first, common, singular, come Kalam, Hashemesh, Shemesh is the noun for sun, it has the definite article, Yareach is the noun for moon, and it has the definite article on it. Achad is one, Asar is ten, one and ten is eleven. Kokavim is the plural noun, stars, from Kokav. You have the im, from the, the im noun, plural, masculine suffix, suffix on it. So it's Kokavim, stars. Mishtach Hawim is from Chawa, to do obeisance. It's from the Hishtafel. It is a Hishtafel participle, masculine plural. The main prefix tells you it's a participle, and participles take noun endings, so it has a masculine plural ending because the subjects of it are the moon, the, the, uh, excuse me, the sun, the moon, and 11 stars. So it has 13 subjects, so it's going to be a plural participle. And we is the Laman preposition plus a first common singular pronominal suffix. To me. Jan? Is there a significance in translation uh, second hine with the uh, wa conjunction? No. Uh, and we don't translate it. You don't need to translate it. And there's no uh, exegetical significance other than saying that he's seeing, uh, he's seeing two, he's, here he's, he's talking about two, di uh, two different things. He's saying, I had a, a dream, and uh, this was the, what I saw in the dream. To behold, he made. Part of the dream report. Okay? Yes. So in dream reports, <laughs> did Dr. Parnell get you, David? <laughs> uh, um, so in dream reports, the hine is never translated. In dream reports, never translated. He's, so even even though um, the first hine, he hasn't even begun to tell exactly what the dream is. But he's reporting about his dream. He's saying, I had a dream. Okay. All right. Okay. Yes, Jeff? Your question on the Hebrew numbers. We have uh, 110 and before we had 710. Are they always like that, or is there some like 20 that actually has a number? Well, es, uh, Esrim, the plural of Asar, or Eser, is what is 20. So is, there, is it always a plural on the, like how would you say 30? Then? 30 would be Shiloshim. Shalosh is 3, Shiloshim is 30, Arba is 4, Arba'im is 40. And so when you pluralize one of the numbers, it becomes the tails of the number. Okay? All right? But 10 by itself is asar or eser, has two different forms. And uh, in the plural of the plural of 10 becomes 20. All right? Anyone else? Other questions? Okay. Then let's go to uh, verse 10 then. And verse 10, Dennis, uh, read through to the Akhmak, please. Yeah, Dr. Sullivan, they dream the version I have in my book. Why don't you say that? Last of Fair. Why you sat here? Why you sat here? L. Avo. Avi. Avi. Hello. 
Dogish in the final tau, that should probably be pronounced halam Yes. Yeah. And he recounted, or so he recounted, to his father and to his brothers. He was rebuked by. It also says cow, it's not a uh, So it's not passive. Uh, not by. Avi, oh, his father. His, his father rebuked him? Yes. The bath is just introducing the direct object of Dyer. Okay. His father rebuked him and said, And said low. So, one, two. And said to. Said to him, what? What? This dream? What is this dream? Is, yes, you've got to correct me. What is this dream? Which you dreamt. Which you dreamt. Okay, good. Excellent. All right. Then he reported, recounted, told, however you want to translate Safar, his father and his brothers, and depending on how you translate that, if, it, if he recounted to his brothers or he told uh, his father and his brothers. Uh, so his father rebuked him and said to him, what is this dream which or that you have dream. Alright? I think we've had all these except for Wayigar. Wayigar has a pathic instead of a holum with the ayin because that's a guttural. Prefers a class vowels. It is a cal imperfect third masculine singular from dot air. It takes a baith preposition introducing its direct object in the accusative. So he rebuked him. His father rebuked him. Alright? Other questions? Kalamata is a Cal perfect second masculine singular from Kalam. Other questions? Anyone? All right. Let's go to the last half of, of this verse then. And uh, Jan, I think we're you. Hebon abon ani vayimka. The Heka Lehish Dahot Leka Aretza. Aretza. And the, the, the verb on that line that's a little bit difficult to, to uh, pronounce is Lehish Tachawot. Lehish Tachawot. All right, go ahead and I'll translate. Will uh, will I indeed will uh, will come and your mother and your brother to bow down to the earth before you? All right. And as we're looking at this, uh, when we translate it, Navo is a cal imperfect first common plural. So shall we indeed come? And then explains who is included in the we. I and your mother and your brothers. Shall we indeed come, I and your mother and your brothers, to bow down to you on the ground? Okay. Any questions? Yes, it's appropriate to include both the we and the group. Uh, you have to if you're going to translate it accurately. Even. It wouldn't be appropriate unless you put the then. Thank you. Shall, <laughs> shall I and your brothers no. and your mother? No, because it says we. 
Okay. And it's better because if you say I and your brother and your mother and your brothers, that almost gives the idea of they by context. So you have to be careful. I would I would do it as we. It makes it extra emphatic here, and uh, it helps to uh, bring that out. The explanation of the subject. There's a reasons for him doing that. So I would prefer that you translate as we come and then go on and specify who's included in the lead. That'd be my preference. Thank you. You wouldn't have it marked off other than maybe I put a question mark and circle it. If you had if you left off the we and said shall I, your your mother and your brothers come. I would not go further than that, but I would question it because I think it's better to do it by reading the we. Okay? All right. Yes, John? The habo right before that is hebo. That's the 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 interrogative hey. The interrogative hey, correct. On a cow. On a cow. Perfect. Infinitive. Absolute. <clears throat> oh, okay. So so is that a is that a pre positive intensive? Absolutely. With yes. uh, interrogative. Yes. Mm -hmm. Just like we had with hemalok, Timlok. Here we have hebo navo. Shall we indeed come? Will we really come? I and your mother and your brothers to bow down to the ground to you? Yes. What no. other, um, what else can be added to the absolute infinitives? Because I always thought that they had to be absolutely alone. Uh, you can have a preposition, I mean, excuse me, not a preposition, excuse me, a conjunction, wow. The conjunction, wow, can be added to them, and the interrogative particle can be put on, nothing else. Okay, but no, um, Prepositions. No prepositions. Okay. Right. Okay. You have no choice about where to put the interrogative uh, particle because it has to go at the beginning. Okay. Anyone else? And that also reminds you of the rules in Hebrew. There's an exception to every rule. <laughs> All right. Yes. This may sound silly question, but where do you get to the ground? Artsa. Artsa. Notice the comments hey on the ending. Uh -huh. That's the locative or directive hey. Okay? The locative or directive hey. When you see that comments hey on the end of the noun, you mean it's to or in something. And since it's not into the ground here, obviously, it's to the ground. Yes, Franz? Can it also convey the meaning that they bow down to him the earth? Thinking back of the dream that he had. The sun, and the, uh, the, the, the sun and the moon and the stars bind down to him. No, the, the earth can't be bowing down. The no, earth but here. Be, they bind down to the earth. They're not bowing down to the earth like worshiping the earth, no. It's the idea of the earthward, groundward. It's a directive and locative take. But the in fact this common see on the end makes it impossible to take it as an object. It has to be a uh, prepositional adverbial concept of direction. All right, verse 11. Uh, George, if you will read that, please, and translate. Wag ye kaneu mo ehau we avi shamer et hadavar all right, the first word there would be Wayikanau. Wayikanau mo. At how? All right. Translation. Then his brothers were envious of him, and his father was careful about the matter. All right, or his father kept the matter, guarded the matter, shamer. All right, so his brothers were envious of him, or we could translate envied him, or were jealous of him, and but, we'd say but his father. Why? Because the wow on avi is a wow on a non-verb. That makes it then a disjunctive clause. Wow plus non-verb is a disjunctive clause. Hebrew Bible insert. Section 3.2.2. And disjunctive clauses serve two purposes primarily. 
that of contrast, therefore translating but, or that of providing background information in which it is not translated and normally is put in parentheses, or it can be put in parentheses. Here it's his brothers versus his father. It's a contrast of their two reactions. His brothers were jealous, but his father kept the matter. Kept the matter. In other words, like Mary in the Gospels, when she considered the things that were happening around Jesus, she took them to heart, she kept them in her heart, she stored them up in her memory. That's the same concept here, he kept it. Okay? Any questions on verse 11? Uh, by the way, Wayikanau is from Kane. Uh, this is a uh, imperfect, and because uh, of the schwa on the front of it, don't think that it is a PL because there's no doubling doggish in the noon notice. It's from Kof Noon Allah. And this would normally be taken as a Cal Imperfect Third Masculine Plural. And we need to check that in the lexicon to find out if there's an alternate form for the PL without the doggish though, just to make certain. And so Kana, Kane, in the lexicon is uh, listed on uh, page 320, and it's found only in the PL and hip deal, so it can't be a cow. So it's a PL, it's an alternative form, it's one in which then the schwa under the noon reduces that to where it cannot take the doubling doggish. So it's a PL imperfect third masculine plural from kana, kane, and it takes the bait preposition to indicate the direct object or the accusative. Question, Jeff? How do you translate in? Kept the matter, kept the word. Is there a way of smoothing that out where it sounds better? Kept the matter. Uh, you could add in your uh, in italics to himself. He kept the matter to himself, or he kept the matter in his mind, or he preserved the matter in his memory. There's different ways you could add to that to indicate exactly what it's talking about. But if you add to it, you certainly put it in italics. And you're comfortable with us doing that? I'm comfortable with you doing that, yes. Especially in a situation like this. This is a very short, abbreviated statement, and there's more involved in Shamer than meets the eye. And so you could say, in his heart, to himself, but always put that on italics if you have it. David? Um, so I think you just alluded to that there's a different ways that Shamer can function? Yes. Um, Shamer has a variety of meanings. So is it in the sense he's he is keeping it to himself and kind of internalizing it, or is that he's keeping watch over the matter? Uh, no, he's keeping it. He's he's keeping it in memory, preserving the memory of it. Okay. He's remembering it, uh, keeping it in store. Uh, if you look at Shamer in your lexicon, uh, in Holiday, and that occurs on page 377, you'll see it can have the meaning watch or guard. It can have the meaning to be careful about or protect. It can have the meaning save or retain, and under that save or retain, meaning number three, it gives object, food, Genesis 41, 35, silver or goods in Exodus 22, verse uh, six, and the object davar, which we have here, to keep in mind, Genesis 37, 11. But notice that keep in mind is not in bold. If it's not in bold, it's not a gloss or translation. If it is in non-bold, it is explanatory. It is telling you meaning, but not necessarily how it should be translated. So you would put keep here would be what you would go ahead and, and translate shamar as, but in mind would be in italics then when you translate it in your translation. Chad? If that's what it means, why can't it be legitimately translated that way? Uh, it's one of the optional meanings. It's not, in other words, in mind could be also in heart. There's a whole variety of things to be said. So rather than making this a fixed translation, it's giving you an optional meaning that's determined by context and other factors. But it is still, it is still okay to translate it's that It's a way? legitimate meaning. You translate keep, but you put in mind in italics. Okay. Hmm. Because all you have is shamer. And there are those cases where you have shamer balevo, kept in his heart. And so we want to reserve that for the cases when you have that specific statement in the Hebrew. 
All right. Everyone okay with that? James? Are there other ways to tra translate the matter, the word? Or well, if you say the word, what word? Some might understand it and might look in the context of which word's being used. Is it sun? Is it moon? Is it bow down? Is it rule? What is it? Uh, when you say word like that, you mean the whole affair, the whole matter. So why not just translate matter? And it's not just it's not just Joseph's words he's keeping in mind. Either. It's it's the whole affair of what's gone on. Okay. All right. Anyone else? All right. Now you have already submitted to me your translation of verses 12 through 25. So let me walk through this with you at this point. And for those of you who do have your translations back from being graded, you can watch it there and. Uh, Otherwise, you can take some notes and look at it when you get that. Wayelaku. This is a cal imperfect uh, third masculine plural from Halak. Echau is the subject. Then his brothers went lir ot to shepherd or to tend or to pasture. Et som the flock. Every hem of their father, Bishakem, in Shechem, in Shechem. All right, let me read that one more time. <coughs> then his brothers went to pasture, to shepherd, to tend the flock of their father, or their father's flock, you can translate either way, in Shechem. Shechem is a place name. Okay, Shechem. And by context, obviously, it is, it's not referring to just the city of Shechem. It's referring to the environs of Shechem, the area of Shechem, because they wouldn't pasture the flock inside the city. It would be outside the city in the pasture lands. Wayomer Yisrael el Yosef. Then Israel said to Joseph, Hello Echeka Roim bi Shechem. Here we have a hey interrogative on the negative. Are not your brothers shepherding? Please use the same translation for ra'ah here as you do in verse 12. By context, don't switch meanings in the middle of the stream. Um, maintain the same by context. Translate the same. If you use pasture, to pasture in verse 12, use pasturing here. If you use tending in verse 12 to tend, use tending here. Uh, and you'll have to add flock here in italics if you want to use tending. Uh, are not your brothers or aren't your brothers shepherding or aren't they pasturing? Aren't they tending the flock in Shechem? Question mark. Leka we esh lacheka elechem. Leka here is a cal imperative, masculine singular from halak. It also has a comets hay suffix on it. The comets hay suffix on imperatives is in order to give them a sense of urgency. Now the sense of urgency is in giving this command, he is then pleading with, or actually as father to son, telling his son what he wants him to do. When you have halak used before another verb, and it is an imperative prior to a verb that would indicate the continuation of the same action or the same kind of action. It is what we call an introductory imperative. In section 2.2.4 of Hebrew Bible insert, you're talking about the, uh, the moods, the volitional moods, starting with the imperative. And in that it says that sometimes the introductory imperative, usually from halak or bo or kum, is utilized at the beginning of a statement and it is not to be translated. It is not to be translated. It's an introductory imperative. It does not mean literally, go and I will send, in the sense of you go and if you're going, then I will send you. And that's how oftentimes people preach this passage as well. And I've heard preachers get up and say, this means that if you want to obey God, you have to be like Joseph and his father. You need to be going first, and then he will send you where you want him to do, where he wants you to go. That's not what's being talked about here at all. How in the world would he do that? 
send a pigeon after him, a carrier pigeon, a courier pigeon. He had no means of communicating with him after he went. He didn't use ESP. This is an introductory imperative. It means I'm going to send you immediately. That's what it means. The la cause, the introductory imperative, stating the urgency. I am going to send you immediately to them. All right. Wayomer lo hineni. I'm sorry. Yes. So you translated that I am sending you immediately to them, or I'm sending you immediately to yes. them. Yes. Right. I'm going to send you immediately to them. Okay. Or I am sending you immediately to them. I am sending you right now to them. We do not translate the ka as go. I'm standing back to the like this. Wayomer lo. And we can translate this, so he answered to him, or so he responded to him, or just say he replied to him, he responded to him, and he is obviously Joseph. He replied to him, Hineni. Hineni literally is behold me. Please don't double translate Hine by saying something like, behold, I am here. Because Hineni means I am here. So if you translate it, behold, you're translating Hine once, I am here, you're translating it twice. It's just I am here. In actuality, what he's saying is I'm ready. I'm ready. He maybe means present, sir, and ready to obey. All right? So he maybe, I would like to see translated as uh, I'm ready. If you have translated as uh, behold me, fine, but that's kind of awkward, doesn't say much to a modern English reader. If you translate I am here, that's absolutely fine. I have no problem with that. If you translate present, no problem there, except it seems a little bit awkward here if you have nothing else than that. So, I'm ready, is his response. Hineni is a response of a person who's willing to do what he's being asked to do. Uh, by the way, when you translate this in verse 13, you have two different paragraphs here, because you have two different speakers. New speaker means new paragraph. That's the way we handle it in English. Open up a novel, read it. Look at conversations, you'll find the conversations are each paragraph, each speaker has a different paragraph. All right? Verse 14, Wayomer lo, he answered, and here you can just say he answered, you can say he responded to him, uh, so he said to him, Lekna re'e, here we have another introductory imperative from Halak again. Lek is the cal imperative masculine singular from halak. Here, instead of having a comment's hey, it uses na with the same intensification as the comment's hey. It is the idea of a sense of urgency. And re'e is also a cal imperative masculine singular from ra'a. So, do we say go, see? You could, and I'm not going to get terribly upset if you do, but in reality, it's to find out immediately. Find out right now. Find out the welfare, shalom, of your brothers and the welfare of the flock. Okay? The idea of re'e here is to see, to find out, uh, Ra'a has a wide range of meanings. It can mean provide, it can mean select, it can mean to choose. Uh, there's a large number of ways to translate it. In this case, I think it's the idea of to find out. It's much like bakash, to seek. And uh, here with this, with lekna re'e, it has the idea of to find out. And it's kind of emphatic, find out the welfare of your brothers and the welfare of the flock, the condition of your brothers, the condition of the flock, how your brothers are and how the flock is. There's another way to translate. Perfectly legitimate to translate that way. Don't translate as peace. All right? It's not a difference between peace and war. It's not going back and talking about, well, his brothers could not speak peaceably with him. If you translate as peace, that's the first thing your readers are going to do. They're going to go back and say, oh, that must have something to do with the peace back here. And it has nothing to do with peace at all. It's the idea of welfare. Shalom has that idea of welfare, condition, 
uh, it has the idea of how someone is. Uh, that's why ma shuang ka means how are you. Literally, what is your condition? What is your peace? Well, it's not really peace that's being talked about. It's your welfare. Are you well? How are you? Okay? If you translate again as go immediately, uh, find out the welfare of your brothers, the welfare of the flock. I'm not going to gripe about that too much. I'll circle it and put a question mark there just to let you know my own opinion. But uh, there's enough variation here in how to translate this among the commentators and the grammars that I'm not going to be squeamish over one way or the other on this, of those two options. Waheshibeni. This is from the root shuv. To return, it's in the hifiel. It's a hifiel imperative, masculine singular, with a first common singular pronominal suffix. And return to me, bring back to me, davar, word, bring word back to me. Wayishlachehu, <coughs> thus he sent him. Cal imperfect, third masculine singular with a third masculine singular pronominal suffix, may emet Hebron, from the valley of Hebron. The valley, the should not be in italics, because emek is in the construct state with Hebron. Hebron is a proper noun, it is a name, therefore it is definite. Therefore in the construct state, both nouns become definite, from the valley of Hebron. Wayavo, cal imperfect, Third masculine singular from both. Then he came to Shechem. Shechema. Shechema. Excuse me, not Shechema. 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 Notice the comments. Hey, directive. Came to Shechem or entered Shechem. You don't have to say entered into Shechem because entered already includes the idea of entry. So you don't have to add into. But that's the comments. Hey, directive or locative. Right. Verse 15. Oh, any question on verse 14 before I go further? Scott. Parsing on Waheshne, Waheshbani, Waheshbani. That's a hifial imperative masculine singular with the first common singular pronominal suffix. Would you address the pointing underneath the hay? The hay with the uh, hotipathic is because the third syllable back. In fact, it's the fourth syllable back there. It just can't keep a path back there. All right. <clears throat> Other questions on verse 14? All right. Verse 15. Wayimsa ehu ish. So, or then, a man found him. Now, some of you translate that as happened to meet him. Uh, th that's all right. Uh, it is one of the translations I think is offered by Holiday's Lexicon. Uh, I think that in some ways it misconstrues the story and it misses some of the key word plays within the story. Let me explain. Matzah literally means to find. The idea that he found him is the same as you would say, well, I, I was out uh, walking along the street and I found a person sitting on the sidewalk with his head bleeding. You said, I found. You don't say, I happened to meet. Because the happen to meet doesn't have the same thing as finding someone in distress. And here Joseph is obviously in distress. A passerby, someone else observes him kind of wandering aimlessly. And the word for wander here has the idea of aimless. Ta'a has the idea of aimless, wandering just kind of dazed, walking about, not seeming to have any purpose, not seeming to know what he's doing. And he literally finds him. He finds him somewhere where people wouldn't expect this young man to be. He's 17 years old and he's all alone. What's he doing out here? Just kind of wandering around the field, kind of looking dazed and wondering what to do next. He's immature. He doesn't know what to do. He has the presence of mind to go seek someone to help him with his brothers. He's just wandering around trying to figure out what in the world happened to his brothers. He thought they were here. His father said they were here. And now he can't find them. And he doesn't know what to do. So I, I see no problem with the find. But also in the storyline, notice 
that the man asks him at the end of this verse, ma tib bakesh. Bakesh means to search for. Search and find are a, a pair of terms that go together well, and it helps to bring out the story. The man finds him, and Joseph is seeking something he can't find. And so there's kind of like a little pun going on here in the way that this is recorded and talked about. If you want to say met, we use the same verb we used in 1 Samuel chapter 16 when the elders came out to meet Samuel. And it, they used the verb kara. Kara is the verb to use to meet someone. That's why Holiday then, in knowing that himself, choose to say here to come upon or to happen upon, to meet by accident is his implication. I don't think this, this man is meeting him by accident. I think this man has observed, he's found him there, observed this, and then goes to him. And I think that's the reason Matsah is the chosen verb here. So a man found him, and behold, and here again the behold doesn't really need to be translated. It's just to tell the reader, to signal the reader that uh, there's a, a, a description going on here. Uh, and he was wandering, a cow, active participle, masculine, singular, in the field. If you translate as any open field, that's fine. That's obviously outside the city. And uh, the idea is it's a place where you wouldn't expect to find a 17-year-old at that time, doing things to do Chad and then, and then Kelly. Uh, I had a question about the matzah. Yes. You said that to, to meet by chance isn't right because, you know... I would, I would not prefer... Yes, you don't know, because, because um, the man is... Like use the example of the person injured on the street. So if you just meet someone, there's no right. notion there of him being hurt. Or, right. right. And also the wordplay between find and seek in this text. So I saw the definition find, and I thought, well, when I think find, I think well, he's looking or searching. And the man wasn't really looking or searching for him. He no. didn't. He did happen upon him. So I saw Holiday had this little note: um, find equals come upon. And again, that's not in bold, but I translate it as came upon. No, that's fine. Can, uh, I, I will circle it for the question mark because I think, it's, as I explained, I think it ought to be kept as found. Because in English, we use found in that sense. It's not necessarily finding something you lost. It's just the idea of I found someone, I found something, and so it's legitimate. And I think it helps preserve in English the wordplay. But couldn't f um, find be misinterpreted as um, found something you're looking for because we use that. I word think too. when you go through the context here, read the context. I don't think an English reader would make that mistake. Okay. Possible, yes, but I would say most of them would not see that. Okay, Kelly. Uh, just thinking through, uh, like teaching um, yes. about Joseph. Would it be reading too much to use this um, as an example of maybe his immaturity as a 17-year-old? Like going back to when he's telling his brothers his dreams. Jealousy's being created, even his father's questioning what he's saying. So Joseph kind of didn't go about the right way of telling his dreams. And then the fact that he would be a 17-year-old, obviously his brothers aren't there, but rather than seeking help, he just wanders around. Yeah, I think, that, as I mentioned before, yes. Okay. I believe that's perfectly legitimate. And then to compare that to later in Genesis when you see Joseph exuding maturity and right. wisdom. And he obviously goes through a change, a transformation. He grows up. Okay. Yes, I, I think that's perfectly legitimate. Okay. So a man found him, and he was wandering in the field. So he asked him. He found him, so he asked him. Result. So he asked him, a cow imperfect, third masculine singular, with a third masculine singular pronominal suffix, and it's the man. So the man asked him, the previously mentioned man, obviously, and here in Lemur, you can translate it as saying, or you can just leave it out. It can be, it's just like the recitative hati in Greek. It's just like putting a colon or a comma before your quotation. What are you seeking? Or for what are you looking? All right? Ma tibakesh. And that's obviously a question. And obviously would be uh, input in double quotes because it's a statement. Uh, tibakesh is a PL imperfect second masculine singular from Lakesh. Any further questions on verse 15? Okay, verse 16. Wayomer et ahai anoki mibakesh. 
He responded, he replied, he answered, I am seeking my brothers. Now the reason he puts F Achai first is because that's the answer to the question. Remember in Hebrew, the answer to the question is always put first. And the man didn't ask about his brothers because he didn't know about his brothers. But it is the answer. It responds to man. What? His answer immediately. My brothers. Anoki, first common singular pronoun. The pronoun is put before the participle in its normal position. There's nothing emphatic about it. There's nothing emphatic about the word order here because the normal answer to a question put in the answer first and the pronoun goes before the participle and the participle is a PL participle uh, masculine singular because Joseph is the one talking. I am seeking. Okay, literally, my brothers, I am seeking. Hagidana. Hagida is a ithiel imperative, masculine singular, from Nagad, noon gimel dal, from Nagad, with a comets hay suffix, making it urgent, plus the na, making it urgent. So we have a double particle here of urgency. It is perfectly legitimate in this case. This is a 17-year-old addressing a stranger, a man, who has approached him to help, he's saying, please, please tell me, please make known to me, please reveal to me. Any of those translations will fit. Okay? Please tell me, please make known to me, please reveal to me, please disclose to me. A foe where came Roim, where they are shepherds or where they are pasturing, or where they are tending italics, the flock. Okay? Question on verse 16. Any questions? Yes. Uh, I actually have a question about the previous uh, verse. On verse 15? Yeah, about the use of lame more. Do we need to somehow distinguish that from, um, I guess, do we need to somehow distinguish that from any other time, like, quotations given, like, no, no. So, no. Uh, lay more is sometimes used, sometimes not. In any case, you really don't have to translate it. You don't have to say saying. You can just put a comma and put your double quotes. It's behaving the same, as I said, as the hati recitative, recitative in uh, Greek, where hati serves the same purpose. It just introduces and is basically the same as a colon or a comma or the beginning of a double quote. Okay. Yes, Tom? Dr. Baird, just a question off of what Kelly said. If he is wandering around, and yet here it says that he's seeking and it's emphatic and it's urgency, where are they? Uh, does that mean that he is... Well, there's, like no, there's nothing emphatic about his saying seeking. Remember? Nothing emphatic on that. He says, I am seeking my brothers. My brothers is not put forward for emphasis. It's being put forward because questions are answered by the words that are the answer being put first. But he has urgency. No, there's no urgency. Oh, okay. No, the urgency is down here in verse 16. Uh, make known. The urgency is the making known, not seeking. The PL is normal for Bakash, and so there's nothing intensive there. The intensity is in his question, in his command here, or his, his actually it's an imperative, but it's, it's the idea of uh, uh, a plea, not a command. Uh, the, the urgency is in please make known to me. Please reveal to me. That's where the emphasis is, the focus. That's the intensity. So he's pleading, and the intensity is on the plea. Yeah. And you're saying that, uh, that he's wandering around, though he's seeking his brother. Uh, but that shows his immaturity? His immaturity is the fact he hasn't gone somewhere to find help. He's in Shechem. He's near the city of Shechem. He could have gone to the city and asked for help. He could have sought out a person somewhere to ask for help. But he's just wandering around. The idea here, and, and the whole idea of the man finding him mm -hmm. is the idea that this is unusual for him to be here, for him to be doing this. He's probably out there for some amount of time. And uh, it's, it, it's, it's not normal behavior. An adult in that setting, not seeing his brothers, would have gone directly to town and went to the nearest pub or, or the nearest caravansary or the nearest inn and said, have you seen so-and-so? And listed his brothers and said, they were shepherding here outside of town. What can you tell me about them? 
he's wandering around. And the verb to'e, both used in the participle, showing the continuous activity, and the very semantics of ta'a, ta'a, uh, has the idea of to wander aimlessly. 